So hello, uh, my name is, uh, as, as I've just been introduced, Robert McCarthy. I've been at IBM for 17 years now. And I guess the one thing that I figured in my 17 years in IBM is the only constant is change. And through my 17 years, I've seen much change at IBM. I've seen iterations of change. I've seen us going through various paradigms. And we're actually going through a change again as we speak. So over the last two to three years, you know, three years ago, IBM was a very successful $100 billion company, um, making that sort of profit every year by building servers, by selling software and services on the back of those servers. And then as Martin alluded to, the game changed, things moved to the cloud, so we found ourselves in this cycle of change again. And today IBM is moving to become a cloud and cognitive company. So I've heard your, your, your question around artificial intelligence. We call it augmented intelligence rather than artificial intelligence, but that's really where IBM is going. IBM is an organization of 400,000 people in 170 companies around the world. We spend more dollars in research and innovation than any other company on the planet. We're the largest industrial research organization. But effectively, that doesn't mean anything to us here in Ireland because we're in competition with those other 400,000 people around the world. We have to try and win mission into Ireland and create jobs for Ireland. So what I'm going to do here today is tell you a little bit of a story about how we try to do that, and I hope you find it interesting. So this is a little bit about our history in Ireland. We're here since 1956. We set up with three people in the Shelburne Hotel selling typewriters, would you believe? That's really how we started out. And then we set up, uh, I, I guess, a sales, an indigenous sales and development organization, really sort of for the distribution of those, those typewriters. And then IBM started to think about computing, and we got involved with Bank of Ireland, I guess, and, and Aer Lingus. So we then basically had a need to develop a software lab in Ireland to support that business, if you like. So really in 1981, that's when we seen that started to emerge. And then uh, in 1994, it says 95 here, but 94 the deal was done to buy the Lotus Corporation. So Lotus was, I suppose, the original messaging, messaging organization. So I'm sure people are familiar with Lotus Notes and CC Mail and that kind of thing. I started in Lotus 17 years ago. And that actually gave us, a, I guess, a corpus for a bigger lab. And we basically moved the, the, the Lotus business from Santry over to our campus in Mulhuddard. And we had a, a software lab of around four or 500 people at the time. And what we were actually doing at the time was localization. So if you think about sort of, you know, artificial intelligence today, that's all based on natural language processing, if you like. And that all started out for us at a, in a spell checker in a Lotus product. So that's really sort of how that's emerged. And then IBM went through this huge acquisitions trail. They were going through a, another sort of invention cycle at the time of, of reiterating who they were. And we started buying a lot of software companies. And effectively, a lot of those software companies were headquartered here in Ireland. So that meant then that our corpus started to grow. And we started to get a mix of different things coming at us. So that made our business more valuable from a diversity perspective. And then in 2009, 2010, we started to realize that the game was changing again. And in Ireland, you know, Ireland, I, IBM in Ireland was traditionally a manufacturing organization. So we needed to sort of get ahead of the posse and to start bringing more high value missions into Ireland. And at the time we were struggling to do that. So we founded these various businesses here. So we set up a business incubation and innovation center. We started, we set up a, a VC center, if you like, in an institute for economic development, a smart cities technology center. And then really what we were doing there was we were using the Irish ecosystem to catapult ourselves. So working with universities, working with SMEs, working with Irish businesses, if you like. And that became quite vibrant for us. Today, IBM is moving into the world of Watson. I'm sure people know what that is. It's really a, an algorithm that uses natural language processing to make sense of things and then to use the, the vast amounts of data that are there to make predictions. So some would call that artificial intelligence, but we really call it a cuddle of aid, if you like, okay? And now today, IBM is making businesses using this Watson technology. So for the first time ever, we're playing in the healthcare space, we're playing in banking, we're playing in IoT, and we believe that this is gonna be a game changer for us and we're sort of betting our, betting our lunch on it, really. This is a little bit about the makeup of IBM in Ireland. So we have three main locations. 
We've got a Dublin Technology Campus where there's about 3,000 3, people come to work every day. That's the biggest IBM campus in Europe. And what's really interesting about that campus is a lot of our diversified businesses are co-located there. That gives us an advantage and we need to figure out how we can take advantage of that. You can see our population is quite interesting. We have a 70-30% female split male-female split, 64% of our, of our population is Irish. We've got 70 different, different nationalities, a very young workforce. So that gives us a really sort of a competitive edge. But how do you keep those people here? How do you keep them interested in being in Ireland? How do you make that sticky? That's some of the stuff I'm going to try and talk about. This is just a little bit of an overview of what we do in Ireland. Um, so we've got a, a research organization here. There's 200 people in that looking at risk looking at healthcare, looking at sort of IoT technologies, if you like. They're really sort of, you know, uh, looking at blue sky research, deep research, five to six years out, if you like, okay? Then we've got a software development lab, and in there we've got lots of things going on, everything from Watson core development right through to um, banking and IoT. We've got a small integrated supply chain, we've got 160 people working in that, and that's interesting because 10 years ago there would have been 3,000 people working in that, if you like, okay? And we've got a legal resource centre and we've got IBM's bank nested here in Ireland. So that's quite interesting. And then we've got the usual sort of service hubs and, and indigenous Irish businesses, if you like. I work for the lab. There's 1,800 people working in the software lab, if you like. And we're working across numbers of businesses. These are the areas that we focus on. So social is a big area for us. So that's all about sort of how we connect people, how we connect businesses, how we share knowledge, that kind of thing. We're working on mobile because I think Martin alluded to, you know, the mobile device being sort of, you know, the most interesting and revolutionary platform there is. That's a big bet for us as well. So we've got quite a lot of stuff going on there. Interestingly, health is a major play in that particular space. We're doing quite a lot of analytics around Watson and obviously cloud is, a, is, is foremost for us. So if I hadn't looked at the lab, say, for two or three years ago, we would have been doing software development, release management, verification and test, DevOps and architecture, if you like, okay? And that's interesting. And I remember when I joined my boss, a gentleman called Bill Kearney, I said, what are you famous for? And he was saying, well, we do great engineering work. And I said, okay, so who knows about your engineering work? And he had difficulty sort of articulating that. And I guess the point is that I'm making is we were thinking about being a cost center, if you like. We needed to move away from that into being thought leaders. We needed to move away from that into being a profit center for IBM. So this is a little bit of a story about that shift, if you like. So what we started doing then, we started thinking about how do we get closer to the ecosystem? So rather than being an engineering lab, how do we shift from that into being sort of embedded in the ecosystem, being part of the ecosystem, being thought leaders in that ecosystem, and playing that back, if you like, to the mothership in our moment. So, you know, IBM is a very colonial organization, and in these 170 countries, 169 of those countries are colonies of the mothership. A lot of the thought leadership comes out of the US, if you like, and different countries around the world sell it, and, and the luckier countries actually help research and develop it, if you like, but most of the thought leadership is coming out of there. So in Ireland, we wanted to flip that on its head to try and make us sticky, number one, but to get more mission in, and then to start to sort of lead that conversation and lead that journey. So the first thing that we did was we set up what we called an innovation exchange. So if you think about the previous slide that I sort of showed about what was going on in Ireland, well, they were all unique businesses with their own balance sheets, if you like, doing their own things. They weren't talking to one another. In fact, sometimes they were actually in competition with one another. So we really needed to understand that dynamic and put a group in place that could actually help coordinate that resource if you like, okay? The second thing then was that we would set up a lab services group. So this was really, if you think about our 1,800 sort of engineers and researchers in the lab, a lot of those guys are there 20, 25 years. They've embedded intelligence, deep smarts experience that usually stays in the lab. So how do we get that out into the field? How do we let customers know what's going on? How do we engage with universities? How do we make a difference using that embedded intelligence in the lab? And then we set up an executive briefing center. So the executive briefing center was really to bring in C-level folks in organizations so that we could start conversations with them about who we were, so that we could start to create some sort of momentum, if you like, outside of the organization. 
and we also set up a global entrepreneurs program. So that's really working with indigenous, you know, SMEs located in various countries. And what we try and do is we get them on our platforms. So again, validate what Mark was saying. So it's not about us using our own platform, it's about other folks using it and, and sort of adding value for themselves in that particular space. So all this stuff got us thinking. So if you think about sort of, you know, nature and how nature innovates. So things go along at a certain pace. We innovate through evolution in nature. So we wanted to try and do that in IBM as well. So it got us thinking about how we do things and, and the way we've been working and what was broken and what was right. So we did a, a resource analysis about five years ago. So we walked through the whole lab and all of the directors in the lab were saying, we don't really need this. We know what we're doing. You know, I know all this stuff for 15, 20 years. Blah, de, blah, de, blah, de, blah. And there was a little bit of resistance at the time as well. But we plugged on, we went in, we did the resource analysis, it took us about six months. It was a purely sort of MBA by numbers approach to it. But at the end of that resource analysis, we shared the information in a set of slides that actually got people thinking differently. So one sort of program director in a certain area we'll be talking to, who, who, who knew his business like the back of his hand, could now see opportunities by working with another program director in a different business. That had never actually happened before. So we set up this group then called the Innovation Exchange, and the idea of the Innovation Exchange was to integrate across the various brands in IBM, to focus our talents as a corpus in Ireland to make a difference. And that wasn't just for IBM, but it was for Ireland Inc., and it was for everybody that was involved. To ecosystem and partner, and through this paradigm, if you like, this new paradigm, we would innovate and accelerate in a way that we've never done that before. So traditionally in IBM, what happens is, you know, somebody in Armonk or Yorktown will come up with a new product, that would be pushed out to the labs, the guys would develop that on a roadmap. We were basically saying no to this. We wanted to come up with our own ideas, we wanted to do our own things, we wanted to look at the mega trends, and we wanted to create ide ideas and paradigms that were new to the corporation and actually push them back, if you like. So, a big part of that for us was the starting in Ireland. So my experience, I've been a, an innovator for 18 years in IBM now at this stage. And, and, and really, you know, if we think about where we were seven or eight years ago as a supply chain organization, we had to move from that to higher value add research and development activities. So, so really what we did at the time was we used Ireland to help us do that, if you like, okay? And the Irish academic ecosystem was a big part of that. So relationships within Ireland are very important to us because what we do is we sort of get connected but not only that we can do things in a, in a way that shows Ireland is a really neat place to do things it's quick to get things done you can cut through a lot of stuff that you can't in other areas and other regions and, and, and everybody knows everybody so so that sort of plays back very well to 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 the IBM corporation so effectively, these are some of the relationships that we have, and these, these slides are going to be freely available, so you can sort of go deeper on this slide. So the exchange then is really about sort of supporting our sales and, and, and services organization, because what that does is that gives us sort of credibility with the guys downtown who are out there selling. So we will go in and we will support them if they're trying to sort of close a deal, that kind of thing. But that's a very small percentage of what we do. So we're making then corporate links, if you like, into various key areas, and I'm going to talk about that in a little bit more. We're also after building out a pan-European network for ourselves with over 150 networks right across Europe in various other organizations like ourselves, with academic institutions, and with various SMEs, if you like, to sort of make a difference in these particular spaces. And then what we're doing is we're integrating that across, across IBM. These are, the, these are the two areas that we're sort of interested in. Obviously, we're going to align ourselves with where the company is going. So IBM is now becoming a cognitive and artificially intel intelligence organization. So we're basically saying from a cognitive perspective, these are the areas that we're interested in. So it's everything from machine learning and modeling right through to NLP, if you like, which is natural language processing. And then on the cloud stack, we're obviously looking at sort of, you know, architecture stacks right through to how we actually monitor cloud but what we're really interested in is building services on Bluemix. Bluemix is a platform that IBM offers to SMEs so we're building cognitive applications and putting them on there. 
And my group is a small group. There's only sort of 25 of us sort of working in this particular area. But what we're doing is we're sort of focused on these particular uh, industries here. So we're looking at everything from healthcare right through to telco. So really what we're trying to do is do the technical innovation, but do it in a different way. So we're looking at, you know, as engineers, as a group of engineers, it is all about the engineering and engineering excellence. But we're also trying to build, bring in business models to it. And I opened up by saying IBM had the largest industrial organization on the planet. And traditionally, the way IBM would have operated is they would have pushed, if you like, technology into the field. And that's really how we did, how we, how we did things. And people either adopted it or they didn't. Every year we patent more patents than every other, any other company on the planet, but a lot of that stuff is left sitting there and it's not used. So effectively what we want to do is, is to use the ecosystem as a voice, if you like, okay? So what we're doing is we're getting this customer pull, or we're getting a client pull, or a partner pull, if you like. So then we know that the ecosystem is validating what we're doing is right, okay? And that makes a big difference, and that gives us a lot of credibility then back, back with, the, back with the, 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 the corporate guys. So effectively, if we're going to do a project from a technical perspective, it has to have a story. So it has to have something that everybody just gets straight away. It has to have then, you know, um, I guess some, some new IP in that story, if you like, that we can scale, if you like, at a worldwide level. And then finally, you know, we have to have somebody that's willing to partner with us and says there is a need for this. So that sort of then helps us sort of with the business model around that. And through that then we're doing some disruptive things. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about some of the stuff that we're doing. So this is a project called Asgard, okay? It's a security project, if you like. These are the partners that we're actually working with. And you can see that we're working with DCU here in Ireland and, and a lot of partners basically around Europe. So if you think about sort of law enforcement agencies, if you think about our Garda Síochána and you think about sort of the UK police force and, and sort of spread that throughout Europe, if you like, and, and beyond. So all of, these, all of these police forces have all got their own databases, if you like, where they've sort of got information that they build up and they start to sort of build abuse patterns and stuff like that. But what if you could sort of somehow collectively share that data in an anonymized way to start to build up use cases and scenarios and user patterns that, that aren't obvi always obvious, if you like. And what that does then is that build brings in insights, if you like, so that you can really start to predict something's going to happen before it happens. I mean, we're all talking about the dark web now, I don't know if people know what that is. So, so this, we're doing quite a lot of work on this project in that space. The next one is really about sort of uh, cloud technologies, if you like, right? So, you know, we're all hearing about Tesla and automated, automated vehicles and cognitive technologies and so on and so forth, doing self-drive cars. Well, the technology isn't really there to make that happen in the vast array and way that we need that to happen today, if you like. So effectively what we're doing is we're working on 5G technologies in Europe. This is a, a European project, if you like. So it's all about looking at how 5G networks are managed and how we can actually sort of uh, bring that technology to bear then in the mainstream to enable these IoT devices and, and all the things that we need going forward. This is uh, one of my favorite projects. Uh, this is a project that we're doing down in County Cork. It's a Science Foundation Ireland project. Um, effectively, I don't know if many people know this, but Cork has the largest maternity hospital in Europe. I said the largest or the second largest. There's 18,000 pregnancies go through there a year. I don't know what's going on in Cork, but the hospital is very busy, okay? 5% of those pregnancies develop, or develop a, or a condition called preeclampsia. So preeclampsia is really high blood pressure, if you like, in, in, uh, during a pregnancy. So that has to be monitored. So every time you know a, a lady contracts uh, preeclampsia, she now has to go to Cork Maternity Hospital every week to get her blood pressure taken and to give a urine sample, depending on depending on how severe the case is. That means that if she's a first-time mom, that she's probably still working. So it means she's got to get to the hospital. There's no car parking down there, so she's under pressure. Her blood pressure goes right up, and by the time she gets into the hospital and gets her blood pressure taken, her readings are off the wall. The same if she's a second time pregnancy and so on and so forth. What if you could do this blood pressure monitoring remotely? So we're working with a company in Cork called Bioscreen. We're working with Leia Healthcare, UCC and the Infant Centre to do just that. 
So there's a cohort of 200 mums, if you like, in this particular in this particular case, if you like, okay? And what we're doing is we're building up all this monitoring stuff. But what actually comes out of that is more interesting because over a period of time, when you're monitoring folks, you actually then start to build up ambient conditions and ambient knowledge about how they're living their lives, how their pregnancy is going. And then you can start to do the really interesting stuff so you can get into cognitive predictive stuff. So we can actually start to predict now how we think things are going, right? And this is actually a technology that we're talking about commercializing with these particular partners and bringing it worldwide if you like okay. so this is how we this is how we plan on doing this so this is a we've now got a new division called Watson Health in IBM and that's really sort of a, a cognitive health cloud if you like with services built on this health cloud uh, and really we see citizens sort of sharing their data in years to come and there being a common health platform this was happening in the US on the back of Obamacare, but President Trump will probably change all that. But the idea then is, is to really sort of look at how we do something similar in Europe. So with this particular example of, of um, LANOV that I've just spoke about, so really what we've been doing here is building a, a test bed and working with various partners, if you like, in Ireland to build out a proposition, if you like, okay? And we've been using the Irish ecosystem to, to leverage that and to make it happen. So that includes, you know, incentives from government, various grants that are available for partners, and the various ecosystem uh, agencies such as Enterprise Ireland, Science Foundation Ireland, and so on and so forth. And then what we do is we sort of bring that back into the corporation, into the core Watson Health folks, and we tell them our story, and we tell them what we're doing, and we get them excited about it, if you like, so that they start to pay attention. And then what we look to do is, well, how do we do and expand this out in Europe, if you like? So how do we sort of make that happen? So. An organization in Europe that's that's very prevalent is called EIT Health. I don't know if people know about Horizon 2020. Horizon 2020 is spending 82 billion between now and 2020 on various projects. Two billion of that money is set aside through EIT, if you like, okay? But what's interesting to us is it's not the money that EIT are giving, it's the fact that they've got 152 partners already signed up. That's everybody from Philips Healthcare through to various academics like Imperial in, in London, if you like, okay? And and they've got test beds, if you like, with cohorts of people who are prepared to test this technology. So that becomes an amazing um, commercialization platform, if you like. And this is really sort of how we're going to sort of uh, commercialize, if you like, that particular business. So what I've tried to do today is tell you a little bit about our story. I've tried to tell you about how we're sort of taking tactical, technical things using a, a, you know, a business model, if you like, and a, a, I guess an array of innovation to change the way we're thought of in IBM, to show that we're actually thought leaders back to the corporation, and, and, and really to try and make a difference through disruptive innovation. So I'm, I'm, I'm done now, I really just wanted to tell you a story, but what I, what I will say is, I, I'll ask if there's any questions, does anybody want to talk about anything? But I'll, I'll start by also answering the question that you asked Martin about uh, artificial intelligence and, 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 and art, if you like, okay? So IBM Watson is a really interesting, uh, it's really an algorithm, I guess, right? But it's a really interesting algorithm. So we would have started out uh, with Watson about five or six years ago playing Jeopardy. I don't know if anybody knows Jeopardy. Jeopardy's a, a game, a game show on the US where they tell you the answer and you've got to guess the question. So there's Jeopardy masters all over the place. So we basically brought Watson, if you like, to Jeopardy and we entered Watson into Jeopardy as a contestant and it ended up winning the whole competition. But not only that, it ended up sort of getting into the Grand Master battle and winning all the Grand Masters. So Watson is now the, the worldwide Jeopardy champion, if you like, okay? And that's what got us thinking, we can do something really interesting with this and we can sort of change things. And, and that's, So we set up various divisions then to help Watson work. Watson has actually created the first movie trailer um, about two months ago. So I, I don't know like, if, you, if you go to the cinema, but you watch, you know, you, you get the, the movie trailers for what's coming up next. So what they did with Watson was, they basically looked at what makes a good movie trailer, what people want to see in a movie trailer, and they would have talked to various artists, movie producers, cinema goers, basically taking a sort of a design thinking approach to what should a movie trailer actually look like. And then they sort of compile that into Watson, and um, 
created the first Watson movie trailer, if you like, okay, for, you know, Fox Studios or something like that. Now, I can't recall what the name of the, the movie is, but if you Google Watson movie trailer, you, you'll basically see it. And Watson is painting, it's doing art, there's quite a lot of stuff. Martin actually showed that robot earlier on, the, what's it called again? Pepper, the Pepper robot. We've actually put a Watson brain into that as well, if you like, okay? So now you've got a sort of an artificially intelligent Pepper, okay? I think that's actually getting a bit scary, to be honest with you. But that's the way that's the way things are going. So we're sort of working in the world of art as well. So any any questions for me? Okay, I've obviously bored you all to death, so <laughs> thanks very much. Cheers.